This is the OTB Television Network, a service of Capital District Off-Track Betting. Broadcasting live from the Capitol OTB studios, this is Racing Across America with Seth Merrow. Good morning and welcome to Racing Across America on this Saturday morning. I'm Seth Merrill. Thanks for joining us. Thanks also to our uh, sponsor, Woodbine. Woodbine Racing. They kick off today the uh, new turf course. I don't think they're going to get that running for uh, at least a couple of weeks but uh, two turf courses now, plenty of turf racing north of the border. Pick, bet, and cheer on great racing north of the border. Woodbine, and again, we have our annual trip to the Queen's Plate scheduled and ready to go. Looking forward to that, but Woodbine underway a little bit later today. Part of a great racing uh, afternoon, lots of great racing at venues uh, across the country. And one of those venues is Charlestown with the Charlestown Classic uh, this afternoon. And I thought we'd reach out to Eric Zimney from Charlestown to get a little uh table setting as it were for the afternoon at charlestown eric good morning morning seth good segue too because uh much like woodbine our turf course is not ready either so we'll uh, <laughs> we'll be keeping it on the main track today i did see uh colonial downs though i saw that they had the uh uh video the where, where they do that burn every year that is wild it is crazy it is crazy but hey i mean it, it apparently works the <laughs> turf course is pretty renowned so God bless science. Yeah, if people aren't familiar with that, they actually light the entire course on fire a few weeks before the meet, and somehow it grows back, and uh, they're ready to go by the time they fire up the racing. But let's get to Charlestown, and uh, as I say, let's first kind of set the table because uh, it's an afternoon card today, right? It is an afternoon card, 12.30 uh, first post, and we're going to go, uh, you know, till about, about well, there's 6 o'clock. Classic's coming up at about 5.35. Um, so, yep, the only afternoon card we have this year. And uh, I'm just looking, and uh, there are some guarantees, $100,000 guaranteed pick four. Uh, there's a mandatory pick six payout. Got to like that. There's a carryover as well. So wagering-wise, it looks like a fun afternoon, too. Yeah, it's great. Um, you know, the, the pick six with about 180000 a carryover, and the takeout's only 12%. So uh, the last time we, we paid it out uh, on a mandatory payout day, we actually got 13% uh, above the gross pool paid back to better oh, nice. so it, it functioned as a takeout free plus 13 percent and the pick four is a hundred thousand dollar guarantee with a 15 percent takeout um and the fields are, are pretty full in, in all the races uh yeah really really good betting card we're excited to see what kind of volume we do today yeah pick four is going to kick off in uh, race number nine all stakes kicks off at the russell road in race nine and does include that charlestown classic eric, let, eric let's get right to it uh the uh 11th race is the charlestown classic let's get some opinions there while we talk i pulled up a replay i've liked this horse since the end of his two-year-old season diamond king so i pulled up the allowance optional claimer from Golfstream, march 22nd diamond king's going to be the number two horse and again it is an optional claiming uh, allowance win but this is a stakes level performer i think this race is going to set the horse up nicely for this afternoon, maybe a little bit val of value there. Jose or uh, Javier Castellano scheduled to jump on board, but you have Rally Cry in the Classic this afternoon for Pletcher. Imperative, a former winner, comes back as a nine-year-old. You gotta love that discreet lover, the winner of the Jockey Club Gold Cup, scratched in New York a couple of weeks ago, presumably to aim for this spot. Something awesome won the race last year. War Story comes in for George Navarro. I think it's a fun, competitive field. What are your thoughts in the Classic? It, it really is. I mean, it's so you know competitive and deep. You can even mentioned the horse to uh, finish third behind Gift Fox and McKenzie in the Big Cap two weeks ago. I mean, uh, you know, only losing to only losing to the two handy top handicap horse in the country by you know three and a half lengths, and they paid twenty five k to supplement this horse to the race too. So shipping him out here on just two weeks rest uh, and paying that kind of freight. I mean, that kind of 
um, you know, emanating some confidence too. And, and like you said, two past winners with imperative. It's crazy to think of a horse who, uh, in the graded stakes world, who, who, uh, is competing in a race that he won half a decade ago. And he did. He won it in 2014. Um, but Diamond King, yeah, I mean, he looks like he's going to be tough to do. John Service, a foreign race, Charlestown guy. Javier rides this place well. Um, you know, the, the dam has thrown two horses. Uh, one's Diamond King and the other one's Bellafina. So, uh, you know, they, she's done pretty well. And uh, it's pretty even. I, I'd be surprised to see if the favorite was shorter than, say, three to one. Yeah, and I'm just looking, and you got to like this too. It's always fun on these days when you you get the connections coming in. I mentioned Pletcher, I mentioned Castellano, but the Pletcher horse will be Castellano is on Diamond King, but the Pletcher horse will be ridden by uh, John Velasquez. Um, you have Edgar Prado coming into town, uh, Kendrick Carmouche. So uh, that's got to be fun for you guys. Not only do you get a good series of the equine performers, but you get uh, a lot of the familiar human names that uh, folks like to watch on the racetracks around the country as well. Yeah, and that's a big deal for us. You know, I'm not saying that they take it for granted at a, at a Saratoga or Del Mar, but our fans don't get to see Javier or, or Johnny V or these guys up close, Edgar Prado, you know, that close um, over the course of the year. And, and when they come here, um, you know, they, they tend to get, I don't say mobbed after the races for autographs, but, I mean, they are very well received. It's a big deal for our fans. Uh, the weather's perked up and gotten a little sunny here, so hopefully we have a big crowd today. Um, and, and the jocks are always great. I mean, they always, you know, sign what's put in front of them. Um, it's part of what makes the day fun, to be honest. And, and give us a little update. Uh, what does the weather look like, and what are you anticipating for a crowd? I know uh, every year we'll kind of reach out uh, either to Frank Vespi or our friend Gene Kirshner has gone down in years before, and we kind of reach out uh, afterwards and get a little update on what the day was like, and they're always saying a nice day with a nice big crowd, big enthusiastic crowd showing up for the afternoon of racing. What are you expecting today, weather-wise and crowd-wise? Well, crowd-wise, the dining room is, is totally sold out, um, so that, that is good. We expect a big crowd. Last night, uh, probably I say early evening or late afternoon through about midnight, we, we did get a lot of rain. Uh, this track handles the moisture very well. It's still wet this morning, but the sun's out. The wind is uh, blowing a little bit, which is good. I don't know if it'll be fast by by first race. It should be good, though, and I'd say over the course of the day with the sun um, and the really nice weather, uh, it's going to kind of dry out gradually, and I, it might be fast by class at time. Let's just touch on a couple of other notable stakes on the afternoon. Race number nine uh, this afternoon, the Russell Road, $75,000 up for grabs and they'll go seven furlongs. And I pulled up a replay from Oaklawn because this time of year, I like the Oaklawn shippers as they move to other venues. It seems like they do well. They may gain some fitness down at Oaklawn. Whatever it is, they seem to perform well. And Cool Arrow is going to come in from an Oaklawn race. We're going to look at it February 14th. Cool Arrow is the number two horse in the replay. Uh, This horse also won the Hilton Memorial last year on this day and the hilton memorial is aimed for three-year-olds so he's not eligible for that but comes back for the russell road i like uh cool arrow a little bit at a uh, four to one morning line this afternoon but again it's uh familiar faces and a a nice competitive field you have a horse in here conquered fast from joe sharp tommy amos brings in line judge and i think you always have to pay attention to george navarro on these kind of afternoons he has wildwood dancer what are your thoughts on the russell road yeah, no question. It is, a, it is a tough race. And, you know, with Cool Arrow, I mean, like you said, he won the Robert Hilton Memorial here two years ago. This is a unique configuration, and, and one of the variables in handicapping is, is the horse going to take to the track? Is he going to take to a, a two-turn seven ace with turns a little bit tighter than he's used to? Well, with, with Cool Arrow, you, you don't have to worry about that. You know it. He's already done it. Uh, and there are a couple other horses. I don't know if there's one in this spot who has other than Balivor. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a variable. Like you said, Navarro, his horses are always runners when they come here. Tom Amos scratched two horses out of the dance of Bristol, but Line Judge is running here, so he must think this is a good spot for his horse. Uh, and Joe Sharp has not just Cool Arrow, but Concord Fast, much like John Service. Uh, Joe Sharp's a, a born and raised Charlestown guy. So um, not only do we have the guys shipping in, I mean, we've got some cool local connections, not just in the Classic, but in these other races too. Yeah, and I uh, finally want to touch on the, the Hilton for this year's edition because Todd Pletcher brings in Federal Case, and I think because it is Pletcher and Velasquez, Federal Case is going to take a lot of action, comes out of a second in the Hutchison. But I will say, for folks who weren't watching, weren't paying attention, this year's Hutchison was not your father's Hutchison. It was not necessarily a, a, a killer of a field. So the second place there leaves me scratching my head a little bit. 
I thought Malpe was interesting, and we're going to pull up the fairgrounds race from March 22nd. He'll be the number five horse in here. That's only four horse. I'm not sure. We're getting some good number. Joshua Frings. Gabriel says be on board. Velasquez will be on board. Federal Case, the Pletcher runner. But as they say, I'm just a little bit leery of the Pletcher runner. Admiral Lynch uh, in for George Navarro. So again, I think on the three year old side in the $100,000 Robert Hilton Memorial, uh, another nice, interesting field this afternoon. What are your thoughts? It, it is. And I mean, I think you touched on some of the. You know, the major players, of course, and uh, I think another one maybe to keep an eye on, and um, you know, on the thoroughgraph sheets, uh, the eight war toxin is actually a maiden. Uh, he's got some decent numbers in there, and, you know, he's probably going to be, I don't know, 20 to 1 um, in this spot. So I think he might be worth a look, too, if you're looking to spread in that race. But, uh, but you know, the run, I think Malpais had a big buyer in that race uh, down at Fairgrounds, too, and I, he'll buy for favoritism, I think, with federal case. Uh, Admiral Lynch, you know, look, his running lines are good too. And, um, God, this is a race where you might have a core group of three or four horses who are, you know, three to one or lower. And then you're going to have a little bit of a distance back to whoever the fourth choice is. So I feel like that's the kind of race that can kind of blow up, um, blow up the pick six a little bit if you can get, you know, the eight home or some, some horse like that. Yeah, I think it's, uh, as I say, a fun card. A lot of familiar names down there. Uh, that pick four with the guarantee. Uh, starts in race number nine. And, and remind us again, uh, the uh, the pick six situation. Yeah, the pick six, uh, about $180,000 in the carryover, 12% takeout, starts in race eight and runs through the last race in the card. So it, it includes five stakes races, including all the unrestricted ones. Then we have a, a really good allowance race that's uh, got a full field of 10 as the last. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll hopefully, uh, if we get about a million bucks in the pool, we'll have another plus takeout situation for our players. And it is a, a mandatory pay today. Yes, sir, it is. That 180000 will be paid out. All right, that's what we like to hear. And I'm just checking once again. First post today, 1230 in the afternoon. So a little bit different there. But uh, plug in because it, it's a nice, fun car down at Charlestown on this Saturday afternoon. Highlighted by the uh, Charlestown Classic. And Eric, before we let you go, uh, typically when I have guests on, I'll go check the Twitter feeds the night before or the morning of, and I was scrolling through your Twitter feed. My two favorite sports, horse racing and college basketball. I'm a Syracuse graduate, unfortunately, this year. Uh -oh. We were knocked out a little quickly. But I'm seeing you have video, and it looks like maybe, were you at the Final Four? I was at the, game, I was at the Michigan State Duke game in the Elite Eight. Um, which was down here in D.C., which was a okay. great, I mean, that was a great game. That was one of the better games of the tournament, too. I mean, there were so many good ones. But, yeah, as a Georgetown grad, man, we've had some battles over the years. But uh, <laughs> you got, your program's in a little better state than mine right now. Well, uh, uh, you have the, the fun coach, though. And, and I, I was sorry. Yeah, I still, uh, as a Big East guy, that's when I got into the game, certainly. I still root for those Big East teams. So uh, now that we don't have to knock heads with Georgetown, I can root for them. And Patrick Ewing is kind of fun. I was sad to see St. John's let Mullins go. Yeah, that was a weird situation. I know I think Mike Rapoli was pretty outspoken about it, too. But, look, yeah, I mean, you're an old Big East guy. Same with me. And I like when all those teams left the league, I mean, you remember how fun going to yeah. the Garden was for the Big East tournament. And it was, it was a blast. And it just kind of, I don't want to say it ruined it for me. Uh, if I was a Villanova grad, I might feel a little differently. But... Um, it just—it's not the same as you know the old Big East, and that was so much fun. Yeah, the uh, I want to say it was a 30, 30 on thirty, one of the ESPN specials, but they did a great one on the Big East. And, yeah, the rec, and, you rec know, team of the Big East. Yeah, yeah. yeah but watching, you knew it, but just to see it put together in a in a format like that, you realize how special it was and what went on behind the scenes to to kind of make the league what it was. And it, it's too bad that it's gone now, but. Again, still uh, root, like to root for the old Big East teams. All right, uh, little as I say, my two favorite sports. So we went off the rails a little bit to college <laughs> basketball. But again, wish you and everybody down at Charlestown uh, a very good uh, Saturday afternoon. Lots of luck uh, going forward with the Charlestown Classic, and we appreciate the visit. Yeah, thanks, Seth. Good talking to you, man. Eric Zimney from Charlestown, and again, uh, we'll have it on the network this afternoon, the uh, Charlestown Classic, and keep in mind those wagering options, that guaranteed pick four that will kick off in race nine, the uh, mandatory pick six down there. Uh, should be a fun afternoon at Charlestown, highlighted, of course, by the Charlestown Classic. All right, uh, a few minutes before uh, our next guest comes up, and our next guest is going to be Kim Weir from the uh, Thoroughbred Racing Foundation. 
uh, Thoroughbred Retirement Foundation. Uh, they have a little mixer coming up in Saratoga this week. Um, that I thought you might be interested in. Uh, they're also looking for some volunteers, so I thought I'd let her toss some of that info out for anybody that might be interested in the area uh, to go to that mixer coming up and uh, maybe check out uh, being a volunteer if that intrigues you as well. But a little bit after that, I said there's good racing, uh, various venues today. Laurel, a really nice card highlighted by the Tessio. So a little bit later on, Dave Rodman will join us as well. I should, I didn't uh, hit promos at the top of the show, so I probably should jump in with uh, promos because today is a fan appreciation day, and I do want to alert you if you are a, a patron down in the Castleton area, Samson's Easy Bet this afternoon. Fan appreciation from 3 until 6. First 25 folks through the door, uh, $2 bet voucher giveaway item and a racing program. There will be drawings for uh, Kentucky Derby merchandise, complimentary food and beverage. That all happens this afternoon at the Samson's Easy Bet in Castleton. Love to see you down there. And don't forget to click on the Tourney Bets link at CapitalOTB.com for more info on uh, the schedule and the price points and the various formats on the contests. Uh, if you haven't tried it yet, do it. I, I guarantee you will enjoy it and have fun. I always say the contest play makes your handicap a little bit differently, which I think uh, uh, over time improves your handicapping uh, as well do want to uh, alert you to a couple of things coming up to mark on your calendar. First of all, signups are actually open, so you don't have to mark it on your calendar. You can go right to capitalotb.com. Signups for the $2,000 Kentucky Derby bankroll. Uh, Mike Callahan and Sully Crotty will both have $1,000 to play on Kentucky Derby Day, and you can be part of the team. If you get selected, you uh, jump in, and you're one of the uh, folks that will get the proceeds that are split up at the end of the day from what uh, Mike and Sully make. Hopefully they hit some home runs on Derby Day and that 2000 gets jumped up significantly. But again, you can go to the website for more info and to enter for your chance to be on the Kentucky Derby bankroll team. $2,000 to have to play. Also, I want to remind you next Friday, the Bounty Bet. Bounty Bet's a lot of fun and uh, that returns next Friday. We have uh, the last time somebody hit it, so uh, we have Reseated again with the uh, $500, it'll be the Belmont Park. Hey, how about that? We're uh, another sign of spring. We're heading to Belmont. Belmont late pick four next Friday to get a shot at uh, all or part of that bounty. We'll continue to remind you as uh, the week goes along. Also, don't forget the Kentucky Derby seminars coming up uh, that Thursday before uh, the Derby, Thursday, May 2nd. So again, mark that on your calendar, our annual Kentucky Derby seminar, right here at the Clubhouse Racebook, 7-Eleven Central Avenue in Albany. And just before we go to the break, um, news came out. I pulled it up, uh, it was first reported in the racing forum by Steve Anderson, but I pulled up uh, from the LA Times, their story. Santa Anita looks like uh, will cancel racing over the next five Thursdays to shorten their week. Now, according to the LA Times story, um, it was, hadn't been, at the time this was written late last night, it hadn't been officially announced by Santa Anita, but Steve Anderson from the Racing Forum quoted Tim Riffo, so you would assume as the head of Strunner Racing, probably the rival, um, next five Thursdays out. I've said it, and if you heard the handicappers report this morning, I was talking with Brian Addo about it. Keeneland had a number of Santa Anita horses, Southern California horses running, and, and in stakes races, that's not a surprise, but there were some claimers in there. Jeff Mullins one day had a couple of claiming horses in a race, and at, over the past few days in New York, I've noticed Peter Miller has had some uh, Southern California horses, and so it seems like the, the trainers, maybe they sniffed this out and could see that something like this was happening. Boy, I, again, I mentioned on the handicapper support, we have our fingers crossed for Southern California racing. It's a kind of an island unto itself and the horse population is already, it's not as easy as uh, East Coast tracks where, you know, you're based some, someplace like Fairhill, you can go to five different tracks pretty easily and, and you see, if you look at parks and aqueduct and laurel, you see horses from all those different venues coming in. Eh, Santa Anita is not that many other venues out there, so they're really pulling from their own population, um, which already is, you know, a challenge. 
And then with the situation uh, earlier this year, obviously, uh, things became more of a challenge. And again, we have our fingers crossed that get, that gets straightened out. And you don't want to see these trainers and owners kind of bailing out and making the situation worse. That said, you have to, you know, you have to have the horses race to, to make your money. And so if folks were looking at the tea leaves and can kind of anticipate maybe less racing available, you can understand why they left. But uh, we hope that doesn't then exacerbate the problem. I think things will eventually level out out there and the, the, the trainers and owners who maybe have moved east, uh, that will be a temporary situation and things will mitigate out there. But do note, uh, it looks like, and again, we'll just wait for that to absolutely be verified, but it looks like it's San Anita the next five Thursdays will uh, be uh, canceled. Uh, cutting t essentially a Friday, Saturday, Sunday uh, racing week over the next few weeks out at Santa Anita. All right, we'll, we'll take a break. When we come back, our friend Kim Weir will join us, Thoroughbred Retirement Foundation. As I say, they have a little mixer coming up next week in Saratoga. You might be interested in that. We'll learn more. And coming up a little bit later on, Dave Rodman from Laurel. Stay tuned. Here in upstate New York, no one provides bettors with more wagering options than Capital OTB. Our network of branch and easy bet locations stretches from the mid-Hudson Valley all the way to the Canadian border and west to central New York. So whether you need to place a bet, fund your Capital Bets account, or watch the next big race, all the action is just around the corner. A full list of our branch and easy bet locations can be found online at CapitalOTB.com. Capital OTB, the better and most convenient choice for wagering in upstate New York. No matter where in the world you are, the excitement of wagering on horse racing is just a click away. You'll get live streaming, past performances, race replays, our virtual tote board, analysis and selections from professional handicappers, a simple, safe and secure wagering platform, and best of all, you get track prices. CapitalOTBBet.com. Bet any place, anytime at CapitalOTBBet.com. And be sure to download our new mobile app from the iTunes Store or Google Play. What if there was a way to become a better horse player, to have a better knowledge of the game, to be more successful? What if there were a way to take what you've learned, what you know, and make better decisions, better choices, to know how to connect the dots? In horse racing, knowledge is a powerful tool, but not the only tool. Race results and replays, past performances and live streaming, wagering from all your digital devices, these two are important tools, and you'll find them all right here at Capital OTB. Capital OTB. Become a better horse player. Across America, we are joined now by our friend Kim Weir from the Thoroughbred Retirement Foundation. As they say, they have a little mixer coming up uh, later this week. We'll hit on that and some uh, other news. Kim, good morning. Good morning, Seth. It's great to be here with you. Thank you. Happy to have you on board. Usually uh, we have you live up at Saratoga and always happy to see you, but happy to check in by phone because, again, I got the press release uh, a week or so ago about the event coming up in Saratoga. I wanted to touch on that. I also wanted to touch on the fact that you're looking for volunteers. And so I thought there may be folks out in the audience interested in uh, those kind of things. So I thought we would get you in to talk a little bit about it. But before we get to those specifics, just give us an overview. We've had you on before, but again, for people who aren't familiar, the TRF Foundation. Sorry, I'm happy to for no longer looking at a racetrack from possible neglect, abuse, and slaughter. So we take the horses after their racing career is over, and make sure that if they can't pursue another athletic career, many of them do, and we love that. But if they can't, we're going to take them, give them for home, and put them to work as teachers in our TRF Second Chance, which uh, it works with correctional facilities and provides vocational training who are looking to move on with their lives. So uh, that's what we do in a very quick nutshell, and it's always a pleasure to talk about it and to engage people in what we do, which is where the call for volunteers comes in. Um, and I was at the website last night. We pulled up some shots from the, the wall kill facility, and again, uh, it's a great program. It combines the, those retired thoroughbreds with inmates. It, I think, benefits both the human and the animal, as it were. And Wallkill is just one of a number of facilities. 
Exactly. We started 35 years ago. The first horse that the TRF took in, his name was Promised Road, and he stepped off the van at the Wallkill Correctional Facility, where we've been doing that program for 35 years, and we have six other programs in six other states. It's a fully national program. Uh, in fact, I'm here in Virginia today where we have one of those programs. I was in Maryland yesterday visiting one of our programs. So the horses are doing the good work all across America. That, they're not only racing across America, Seth, they are also teaching across America. So you're on the TRF road trip. I am. I really am. I'm about 600 miles in. I've got another 600 to go before I'm home tonight. <laughs> uh, oh, nice, nice, oh. nice. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and you're visiting the horses, and I know uh, that opportunity will come for a, a lot of folks if they want to. I know it did last summer, but talk a little bit about summer events coming up and how maybe people can visit with some of the TRF horses. Yes, it is. We are totally gearing up for the fabulous summer, the extended season in Saratoga. So what we do over the summer is we bring five of our horses uh, to Saratoga, just like all the other visitors that come to our fair town. Uh, the horses come to the spa, and we set them up in our TRF summer farm, which is uh, just a few miles um, east of town. And what we'll do is we, we put them there as our herd ambassadors. They're really there to meet, greet, eat, treat, take photos, get their noses rubbed, and educate fans, community members, and horse lovers about what a retired racehorse looks like, what their life is like. We do that throughout um, the meet, the racing meet, with open barns every Tuesday. This year they're going to be from 5 to 8. We're going to kind of create a happy hour with the horses sort of vibe. So every Tuesday visitors and fans can come meet them, no cost, just come talk to us, talk to the horses. Um, and then we will, at the end of the summer, do a great big barbecue at the barn with the horses. That'll be our fundraiser this summer, is to bring families, kids, friends, and neighbors all together at the barn with the horses for a barbecue. Um, so it's a fun plan. We're very excited about the summer. We had a great time last year. That was our first time doing this, but we've got, we've got a bigger plan this year. Um, and that's why we're uh, calling for volunteers. Uh, to, uh, to engage the horses. So we, we love to get people together to help us do our work, and that's what I'm looking for right now. Yeah, we lost you just a little bit as you started to talk about the volunteers, so I'll have you hit on that again. But I'll remind people, uh, I did visit the website, and if you scroll down to the bottom of the page, you'll see a link that says, You Can Help. And when you go to that page, you can scroll down, and there's a, 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 a application you can fill out to become a volunteer. So for the folks in our audience who may be horse lovers and, and kind of think, hey, that would be fun to, to participate with the uh, Thurbert Retirement Foundation. And again, I remind people who aren't familiar, you guys are Saratoga-based. So you're, you're yep. local, and as you say, the horses that uh, folks can visit will obviously be local this summer as well. But visit the website and uh, click on that You Can Help link. And again, talk a little bit uh, again about uh, the volunteers and, and what folks may be uh, required to do. Volunteers will fall into two groups. There's those who are very, very horsey and would like to help us with grooming the horses, handling the horses, maybe even cleaning a stall or two, you know, to really roll up your sleeves, interact with the animals. We are looking for those kind of volunteers. And then we're also looking for a lot of the what I call front of the house, which is folks who can help us sell some merchandise, do some um, outreach for raffle baskets, really be a, spread the word on the front end of education and talking about the TRF. So um, there's a lot of ways for people to engage, and it won't be, it'll really be right-sized for folks' time and energy and interest. Um, what I'll tell you, and this is where I know you reached out, Seth, is that Thursday, Thursday, April 25th, we have a meet and greet at Racing City Brewery, um, which is really just to engage people, meet us, and let us tell you about the the summer farm and what the opportunities are. So that will be 5.30 to 7.30 at Racing City Brewery in Saratoga, right on Excelsior. And one and all are welcome, you know, no cost, cash bar, just come talk to us about it. And again, uh the weather is starting to get warm. The Oklahoma has opened up, and so we're all thinking Saratoga um, and horses, and that's a great way to kind of kick things off with, as I say, the, the springtime season and the weather and horses pulling into town. If folks want to get into gear a little bit early, Racing City uh, Brewery 
on uh, Thursday afternoon at 5.30. And, and have you done these meet and greets before, or is this the inaugural venture? This is the inaugural venture. You know, we've just, um, it, it's, a big, it's a big launch event in many ways. We think that Racing City might be kind of our TRF clubhouse over the <laughs> months ahead because it's got such a great horsey vibe and plenty of parking, and um, both uh, Debrine and Tony are so gracious. So we, we're doing this as a first time and expect it to be a pretty regular gathering, whether that be monthly or every six weeks or so, just to get people together who care about the horses and who love racing. That's the, that's the spirit. Yeah, it's, uh, it looks like it'll be a lot of fun. And, uh, again, we tell people to swing by Thursday at 530 Racing City Brewery, Saratoga Friends of the TRF Meet and Greet. And, and that would be a great place, too, if folks are thinking, hey, maybe I do want to be a volunteer uh, and, and I'd like to learn a little more about it. You guys will all be there yeah. and so they can ask questions there as well. Exactly. We're going to lay it all out and see where folks find their, their niche and what they think would be fun to do. Fun is key, um, and horses are the heart of it. And uh, I can guarantee for folks, Kim is fun. If you want fun, <laughs> Kim's middle name is fun. Oh, and, uh, Kim, we'll, well. We'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll definitely have you uh, to talk more about the summer events and whatnot. Uh, when we arrive up at the back stretch at Saratoga, as I say, we had you a couple times last year and uh, enjoyed giving out the information. <laughs> uh, charity tournament for uh, TRF, and that's today. It is today, right. April 20th. Today. Very good. Thanks, right. Jeff. Appreciate it, Kim. And as I say, waiting down the days. I know. <laughs> Take Very care. Good. Kim Weir from the uh, Thoroughbred Retirement Foundation. I'll uh, take their uh, visit. Uh, and, uh, it's also a great, uh, I'm just going to scroll to the top of the It's always been that way, so I, like I said, I never really think about it, but uh, no, normally the clock is on the wall. For us, security code of honor war of will and by my standards and i'm just looking where my horse has spin off uh that's my interesting horse uh, at this point uh would be 11 12 13 14 15 16 17 18 19 would be not and I'm, i was counting because uh once they get out of the top 10 it's just other horses receiving votes in order of their vote total so they can count through there but spin off which is okay that uh, spinoff going down the list uh, just means uh, more opportunity, perhaps, for uh, some um, value in the Fletcher horse. Third start of the year off the nice try in the Louisiana Derby. And I'm pulling up because there were notes over the past few days of some of the riders' commitments. Uh, Mike Smith has committed to uh, Omaha Beach. That means Flojo, Florent Giraud picks up. Uh, Roadster and Manny Franco will be on spinoff. I don't mind that. Franco, uh, up and coming guy. Uh, so Pletcher, I think, reaching out in an interesting direction for uh, the rider of spinoff. Uh, the opening of Woodbine, which happens this afternoon, also always means the uh, Canadian uh, Sovereign Awards, their version of the Eclipse Awards, come out. They typically are announced a couple of days uh, before the opening of the Woodbine meet at it and they're held at a ceremony um, a couple of days ahead of time and uh, Thursday night it happened and the Canadian horse of the year for 2018 wonder good uh, the winner of the Queen's plate last year she won a couple of legs of the Canadian triple crown did not elect to try the third leg she won the Prince of Wales uh, at Fort Erie in the Queen's Plate, but she did not elect to try the Breeders' Stake back at Woodbine. Instead, she came down to, to Saratoga to try the uh, Alabama. But Wonder Gadot, the uh, Canadian Horse of the Year, uh, older male and uh, male turf horse, Mr. Haverkamp. Um, for our friend Catherine Day Phillips, I always enjoy talking to her when we're up there. Mr. Haverkamp uh, gets named as, again, that champion older male and champion turf male. Uh, Mark Cassie was again named Outstanding Trainer, a uh, 10 times for an award winner. And he is also, it's going to be interesting, what are we looking, I think another couple, to, if I'm not mistaken, 21st or the 22nd, the uh, our National Museum of Racing Hall of Fame uh, entrance will be announced. And, and Mark's a Hall of Fame 
uh, inductee already in the Canadian Racing Hall of Fame, um, but he was an, a nominee this year. I sent my uh, votes in uh, a few weeks ago, and as I say, I'm pretty sure the ballot, the information said 22nd. Sometime this week, I think we'll hear who is going to be inducted this summer into our Hall of Fame, but it's interesting Cassie was on the list. Chiefswood Stables uh, named the uh, outstanding owner. And it was interesting, we talked with Rob Landry. We just uh, happened to run into him uh, Florida Derby week, <coughs> excuse me, when we were down at Palm Meadows. Uh, Rob Landry, the, the manager there, um, and we knew that Chiefswood was uh, a finalist for the uh, Sovereign Award. We talked a little bit about uh, the potential, and you said it's going to be interesting to see uh, when they announce. And, it was more than interesting for Chiefswood as they wind up the uh, outstanding owner. Uh, they had some nice horses, Yorkton, Tis the Slam. Um, also had, I believe, Nipawa, yeah, Nipawa among the, the horses as well. Um, leading jockey was Eureka De Silva, no shock there. Um, and Kimura was the uh, outstanding apprentice. Um, and, and when we were up there, our two visits uh, last year, Kimura was as an apprentice was clearly uh, a horse you had to pay a little bit of attention to. And also I want to tip our cap to our friend Mike Penner at the Horse Racing Radio Network. They were announced as the outstanding uh, audio, visual, and broadcast uh, award winner for the Sovereign Award. So good for uh, Mike and Michelle and the team at uh, Horse Racing Radio Network uh, picking up a uh, Sovereign Award a couple of nights ago up in Canada. All right. We'll swing to our break. When we come back, we'll reach out to Dave Rodman, get some thoughts on Laurel on Saturday afternoon. They have a stakes-laden card, highlighted, I think, by the Tessio. Always mining, looking pretty good in there. But we'll get some of Dave's thoughts right after this. Stay tuned. You have just witnessed a felony. Not at the track and not near a computer? No problem. Wager with Capital OTB's Touchstone Wagering System and you'll never get shut out again. Capital OTB's Touchstone Wagering System is quick, simple to use, and guarantees your wagers are accurate and placed on time. For more information, visit CapitalOTB.com or call Capital OTB's customer service hotline at 800-292-BETS. Capital OTB's Touchstone Wagering System. Never get shut out again. But Game On Dude is just battling them all off. Game On Dude has the lead. Here's Drosselmeyer out of the clouds. Drosselmeyer from nowhere. And Drosselmeyer and Mike Smith have beaten Chantel Sutherland on Game On Dude. Visit Rivers Casino and Resort, the Capital Region's only destination for live table game action and the hottest new slots paying out millions. And they're off. Horse betting is now at Rivers Casino and Resort with capital off-track betting terminals and live tellers located just off the gaming floor at Van Slicks. Get in on all the action at Rivers Casino and Resort. Welcome back to Racing Across America. As promised before the break, joined by our friend Dave Rodman from Laurel on a really nice day down there. A nice stakes afternoon. Dave, good morning. Hey, good morning, Seth. How are you doing today? Very good. Give us a little update. I mean, uh, up here in the capital district of Saratoga, uh, we have, I think, finally entered spring. It's been going back and forth, but yesterday was certainly, temperature-wise, a very nice day. And I'm always amazed. It seems like, it doesn't seem like you're that far south, but it seems like with that outdoor uh, paddock show set, it seems like you guys are without jackets a lot sooner in the year than we are and a lot later in the year than we are. But give us a little update on the weather down there in the Baltimore area. I think you've been fooled by the green screens. We, we've been oh. inside lately. <laughs> All right. okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we, um, it's, it's nice today. Uh, temp going to be in the upper 60s, low 70s. A little bit of a breeze, but the good news is the heavy rain passed through yesterday late afternoon. Early evening we had another burst. But a lot of the heavy, heavy rain really scooted west of Laurel. Um, so we're in good shape. The track is fast. They sealed it up really tight last night. 
and we are on the turf for all of our turf races today, which is a major, major deal given the number of really good stakes that we have. Yeah, and again, it is a nice uh, stakes program. Why don't we jump right in with the Tessio? It's a short field, field of half a dozen, but I think part of that is always mining just scared him away, and he's going to be the one to watch, and it's going to make the, uh, the race fun. We're going to go back and take a look at the replay of the private terms back on March 16th. Always mining will be the number three horse in here. Jovia runs second, the horse that caused a little bit of a uh mix up in the uh, wood memorial but always mining gets it done by a chart margin of just under uh seven lengths that was what one two three four five uh the fifth win in a row one to five on the morning line again it looks like this will just be a setup for the uh, preakness you would have to assume what do yeah. you think of the tessio when and you're in when and you're in is a tessio for preakness so if he wins he's got a place in the starting gate for the preakness Marilyn brad has been making waves here uh, going for now his sixth win in a row. And if you recall, on this show, we tried to beat him. I believe it was in the halfback late last year as a two-year-old in his last start as a juvenile, uh, thinking he may get tested. I'll tell you, uh, he's gotten away with some pretty easy trips and soft fractions in some of his races, uh, including his last start. But what was most impressive about him in the private term was his gallop out. I mean, he just kept on going and going and going. So I don't believe the mile and eighth will be a, any problem here for the son of stay thirsty. And uh, we'll see if uh, Maryland bread can get that birth in the preakness. And uh, speaking about talented uh, three-year-olds in Maryland, uh, had Eric Zimney on earlier um, from Charlestown. They have the Charlestown Classic today. And I mentioned, I like Diamond King going back to his two-year-old season there at Laurel, winning the heft. And I, Diamond King in the Charlestown Classic to me is, is a little bit interesting. It gives some rooting interest to the Maryland folks. Yeah, I remember Diamond King. He was, uh, you know, he looked like he was going to be any kind of horse. So, yeah, the Maryland Breds are doing well. And, uh, boy, it would be nice to see a horse like Always Mining go on to the Preakness with his good tactical early uh, foot and advantage. Uh, you know, the way Pimlico has been playing, uh, he, he could be a, a tough one. And maybe we'll see a Maryland Bred get a share or even win the Preakness for the first time since the Puget testimony. Yeah, uh, normally I look at a 1-5 to five morning line, and I think that's way too short. In this case, I think uh, he's well, going to look yeah, up Yeah, Majid is out of that race, so it's a five-horse field oh, okay. now. I mean, Tybalt, tie I know Claudio Gonzalez is very high on him, but he's met always mining three times and never been able to beat him. The horse, that I think, has a little bit of an upside potential in there is number one, Bozzini, with Trevor McCarthy for Jeremiah Englehart off a real solid... Uh, finish here just seven days ago. Coming back short rest, a positive for trainer Jeremiah Engelhardt. And you know what? I mean, coming off those sprints, he may be the one to test always mining early or at some point in the race. So uh, he's kind of the dark horse to me is Bazin. Interesting. All right, uh, another nice three-year-old, but this time on the female side, will uh, be in the gate for the Weber City Miss. That's going to be race number nine this afternoon. Uh, and Dave, while we talk, we're going to go back and look at the Beyond the Wire, March 16th. Lasitas, uh, and I think I'm pronouncing that right. I've asked it before on that, but we're going to be the number seven horse in here, winning pretty easily by five. And again, Lasitas, uh seven to five on the morning line and, and looks pretty good on the female side of things. What are your thoughts on the Weber City mess? Yeah, La, La Cetas is what okay. I say. It's a little bit of a Hispanic Uh You know, she's uh, won three in a row, done them easily since the addition of Blinker. She's a really sizable, a big filly here for Manfuso and uh, Wayne Harrison and that, uh, Katie Boss and Bobby Manfuso and Katie Boss always breeding top, top notch horses here. We'll uh, see how she does off that mile where she just galloped again with her ears up you know i've just been most impressed by uh, her action in the stretch like she's just kind of waiting on horses so she's the filly to beat in here looking for four straight this afternoon blinkers go on a long shot money from heaven from the hammy smith barn um pat's no fool um up to new york last time out at 16 to 1 against new york reds for gary capuano i'm still kicking myself for not playing the horse that day <laughs> up at aqueduct in winning at 16 to 1. There's an interesting maiden in here, trapped in my mind, who comes out of a strong Oakland Park race, a race that she probably could have won and broke her maiden, but she got caught there with a 60 trip, uh, was closing a lot of ground, very willing in the stretch. So they're taking their shot at maiden against winners in here for Wasabi Ventures. 
on Trainer Hazel's cruise. I think she's going to run a big one at a, at a nice price, and they're trapped in my mind. I, I like Oakland shippers this time of year, too, so at a little bit of a price, I'll give that one uh, an extra look. All right, we move in the other direction, the uh, Pesio Race 10, and we move to Race 9 for the Weber City Miss. Now let's go out to Race 11, a race I like every year, the uh, Henry Clark uh, $100,000 up for grabs a mile on the turf, and I think this is a, a fun field. Flash Phelps is in here, Mo Maverick, uh, Iris Strait, Real Story. And as I looked in, and oh, Dionysus, and as I looked in Handicap, Real Story was kind of jumping out at me with the early speed, and I thought this will be a catch me if you can situation. And then I looked, and there's a couple of the other horses I mentioned, Mo Maverick and Iris Strait have some early speed, uh, John Jones potentially. I'm wondering if the speed will set up four, and we're going to take a look at the Harrison Johnson Memorial from March 16th, and it's going to be the number six cord maker getting it done at, with a nice late run. I'm wondering if we won't get the pace set up that will play into that late run, but this source is a little bit of a question mark on the surface, on the turf. So cord maker's interesting to me with some question marks, however, and I think the pace is going to be very interesting to see how it plays out in the Henry Clark. What are your thoughts? Yeah, this is kind of an open race in here. That huge middle uh, second turn move by Cordmaker is something to behold. If you go back and watch the race, it was a slow pace. Victor Carrasco sensed that slow pace about three eighths to go, moved him up between horses with a surge three, four wide on that final turn, and he sustained that momentum to keep on going. He can settle off the pace. Now, he's been on the turf only one time. He was a beaten favorite back in the spring of last year in a restricted allowance race. But trainer Rodney Jenkins says, he, oh, I'm going to give him one more try on the grass this afternoon. And given the amount of early speed, I think he'll be tough. Now, he's going to be, he's 9 to 5 in the morning line, so I don't know what kind of, kind of price you're going to get on him. Uh, other interesting horses, maybe Just Howard, Maryland bred. <clears throat> Just Howard coming off time away for trainer Graham Motion. He got to toss his last race mile and a half on the point of entry before he was shelled for the winter. And the race before that taken off the turf, and his form looks pretty good. He's got a good kind of settle into stride, three, four, five lengths off the pace kind of style for this race. Irish straight, also interesting, another grab motion runner uh, to me. But again, with the speed in the spot, what's Irish straight's pack going to be? I do like the fact that Irish straight has been able to settle from off the pace and make a bit of a bid. He was third behind Dr. Mounty in a very soft ground yielding turf course here, the Baltimore-Washington Turf Cup Grade 3 race September of 2018 last year. Uh, so he, he does like a little bit of cut in the ground. The turf is not as yielding as it was September of last year with all the rain that we had, but it's got a little bit of uh, give in it because of the rain from yesterday afternoon. He might be okay. I restrate. All right. I like it. And again, uh, those are three of, I'm looking seven stakes today and notable the the rainbow which uh rainbow six which kicks off in race number six it'll be an all stakes rainbow six uh yeah i mean uh it, it, it starts to finish it's just an excellent card the king leatherberry at five and a half furlongs is the six so we got the frank whiteley with a match of lewis field lakai again i love home run maker in there by the way his final furlongs in the fire plug and the allowance races back in november It'll look pretty good. There's going to be a lot of speed in there. Uh, so you might want to look at him this afternoon. The seventh race, uh, Karen from the Grand Motion Barn should be ready and primed after a layoff. In the eighth race, the Dahlia Stakes, my best play of the day, by the way, secret message uh, coming off the grade two, grade one, grade three races, three graded uh, races, actually four straight, I think is stepping into softer company and going to be well prepped after time away. Secret message, the hat-trick filly in today's eighth race, the Dahlia at a mile. Which kicks off the late pick four. And again, the eighth race, secret message. Uh, I'll uh, emphasize that once again because we're looking at a six-to-one morning line. Got to like that. Yeah, I like that. I'd love to get that. <laughs> and uh, it looks like it's going to be a fun afternoon. Again, uh, highlighted by that Tessio. You know, again, I'm always mining one to five, so I don't know. Betty, maybe that's your free square, though, in the rainbow. That allows well, you to it, go you, a little deeper. If you look at it this way, it's either going to be your free square, and if you want to be the rainbow winner, you have to be a single <laughs> ticket. Everybody's going to have always mining on the ticket. So if you're playing the angle of, well, I'm going to beat her and eliminate 80% of the tickets right there, uh, you know, you may want to take a look at uh, Bazzini, the Bazzini I said on the inside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of the horse already. Yeah, yeah, that's um, true. It, it, interesting horse to me. 
uh, in there uh, is for the yeah, you're right. If you're looking to pull down that entire rainbow pool, right, uh, right. take a little shot maybe against. Uh, Dave, as always, uh, appreciate the visit. Wish you and everybody down at Laurel uh, good luck this afternoon on a really nice uh, stakes-laden card, and we'll talk again. Okay, Seth. Good luck. Dave Rodman from Laurel again. Laurel, nice stakes card. And again, we talked with Eric Zimney a little bit earlier. Nice stakes card uh, down there as well, highlighted by the uh, Charlestown Classic. You can catch... Uh, some of those races, of course, right here on the network during the afternoon. I'll be in a couple hours with uh, OTV Live on this Saturday afternoon with plenty of racing action. Should mention uh, at, in New York, there's a couple of nice stakes on the card as well. They have a couple of nice uh, Stallion Series stakes races, the 8th and the 9th today. Uh, it's the girls and the boys. The 8th will be for the 3-year-old uh, Phillies um, going 6.5 furlongs. And again, New York Stallion uh Stakes being and, and the Phillies are a little more lightly raced. The the males in the ninth race have a little more of a resume. But these Phillies, they are you know again restricted to a New York Stallion situation. But uh, I think there's some talent here that'll be worth watching uh, as three-year-old Phillies going forward. I use Stones in the Road uh, on top in that uh, Philly division. Jeremiah Engelhart trainee that won three of the first four but ran a good third again against open three-year-olds in the cicada last time so she'll be interesting to watch on the three-year-old scene new york breads are not i would think but a couple others that uh, are in the mix and usable are even more lately raced and again have the potential to kind of step up and and reveal their talent uh as such that they'll be able to move out into open company going forward the boys are in uh, race number nine and again, a similar situation, Blind Willie McTell, uh, a second to start the career, and then two really nice wins in stakes races. So got the stake, got the maiden breaking victory in the stakes race. Uh, lightly raced with only the three starts. The Linda Rice uh, trainee, again, interesting, certainly this afternoon against restricted company, but has the potential to move forward. Uh, as the year goes along and maybe face some open three-year-olds as well. So, again, a uh, couple of nice stakes races in New York today. Also, um, do want to mention, again, that uh, we are uh, opening day at Woodbine, and I just wanted to pull it up because I, the Toronto newspaper had a nice article uh, about uh, the headline, Wood, Woodbine Horse Racing Returns to Altered Landscape, and noting that and it is worth noting, they're coming back with two turf courses. Uh, the only track on uh, the North American continent that has two uh, turf courses, uh, which is what this article says. I'm not sure that's exactly true. I mean, you have the inner and the outer at uh, some other tracks. I will say, only situation with two kind of unique turf courses. Most of the tracks that have them, like Saratoga has an inner and outer, so there are two turf courses, but they're they're right next to each other so it's a kind of one turf course with a, a rail in the middle maybe is the way you could look at it where this one is and if you've never been to Woodbine that outer turf course is just a unique experience I've talked about it before so at Woodbine now there's an inner turf course there's a synthetic track and then there's the the outer turf course which is the one they've used for years but I've said it before the first time I went to Woodbine live I was standing in the grandstand watching a turf race on the television. And as they came around the turn, my horse took the lead at the top of the stretch and I thought, this is great. And right in front of me was a set of stairs to walk out and watch the race outside. And it's kind of fun to watch that unique, it's a unique situation in North America with the turf course being the outer uh, track. And so I looked up at the TV, oh, I'm in great shape. My horse took the lead coming into the stretch. And I walked down the steps, 10 steps, and opened the door and looked and realized, oh, <laughs> I'm not out of the woods yet. Uh, that, that stretch is very long, and it's very unique, and it, uh, it, it, it's a lot of fun. If you haven't been, uh, I recommend going just for the experience of looking at that, uh, the turf racing uh, there on that very unique outer turf course. Um, but this year, if you're a turf fan, Woodbine is going to play uh, right into your wheelhouse because with the two turf courses. Now, they won't kick into the, the brand new one for a few weeks. I think they're kind of letting it uh, get settled in and uh, you know start to grow and get 
proper routes and whatnot, but uh, they are looking to uh, have plenty of turf racing this season up at Woodbine. And again, we'll be up there uh, for our annual visit, uh, Queens Plate, and then again uh, after the Saratoga season for the Woodbine Mile. Uh, those will be the game plans again this year, and they always treat us very well. We look forward to it, and uh, as I say, I highly recommend it if you haven't been. Um, trying to pull up, I don't know what I did with the notes, but I, I do, I had a couple articles here, and I'm not sure what I did with them, but there wasn't anything more interesting in the article, oh, uh, no, in the article than what I'm going to say. I have it right here. Um, there were two jockey suspensions that were notable because you don't see the length of these suspensions too often. Down at Oaklawn, David Cohen, and down in Florida, Paco Lopez. They're both going to be on the sideline for 60 days. Uh, David Cohen suspended for 60 days for uh, hitting uh, another jockey with the whip multiple times uh, coming into the stretch on April 6th. I'll tell you, I looked up the race. It was the eighth race on April 6th, and I looked at the head-on. It wasn't obvious. So I, I kind of scratched my head, but I'm guessing the 60 days, I would think the stewards didn't take that lightly. So I'm guessing the, it, the, the Cohen and his agent are going to fight it. And, and I'll be interested to see, because again, looking at the head on, it wasn't clear, but the jockey that got hit complained after the race, said he had some welts and some of the other jockeys in the jockey's room, according to the article I read, uh, kind of verified that Cohen after the race made comments that indicated he was intentionally uh, doing it. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out because, man, 60 days, that's that's quite a suspension. And in Florida, Paco Lopez, uh, the Gulfstream stewards, suspended him for uh, 60 days, uh, writing uh, It's My Lucky Charm in the 11th on Sunday. Um, and they said also just kind of a pattern, how they word it, uh, multiple occurrences of being reprimanded, fined, or suspended. So uh, Paco Lopez, David Cohen on the sidelines for, as I say, an, an inordinate uh, amount of time because you don't normally see 60-day suspensions. And we'll see how they play out, whether they can appeal and get those knocked down a little bit or whatnot. Um, but if you don't see their names in the uh, entries at some point for a while, that's why. All right, I'm going to step out of here. do want to remind you, again, promos because uh, today it is the Fan Appreciation Day at the Samson's Easy Bet in Castleton. Stop on by between 3 and 6 p.m. this afternoon and give us our chance to say thank you to you for your patronage. Also, uh, click on the Tourney Bets link on the website. Check out the schedule of contests, price points, and uh, what type of contest, and jump on board and play, and I think you'll have a lot of fun keeping uh, up with uh, what's coming up in the future next Friday is uh, the bounty bet. Bounty bet returns $500 up for grabs. That'll be next Friday with the late pick for at Belmont. We'll remind you about that as the week progresses. Entries are now open for the $2,000 Kentucky Derby bankroll. Mike and Sully will each have $1,000 on Derby Day to play for the bankroll team. And at the end of the day, Everybody splits up what's in the bankroll, and hopefully Mike and Sully knock it up to uh, much, much more. We'll see how it works out on Derby Day, but you certainly want to be in for your chance at a piece of that. Go to the website, capitalotb.com, for more information and to sign up for your chance to get on the Derby team. All right, going to wrap things up on this dish. This edition, do want to thank our friends at uh, Woodbine. Back on board as sponsors. Thanks to them for their sponsorship. Woodbine, pick, bet, and cheer on great racing north of the border. Thanks to Eric Zimney from uh, Charlestown for being on today. Kim Weir from the Thoroughbred Retirement Foundation. Again, they have that mixer coming up on Thursday. The Racing City Brewery up in Saratoga, Thursday at 5.30. Stop by for a little meet and greet. And an early kickoff to your Saratoga season, as it were. And thanks again to Dave Rodman for uh, talking a little Laurel on what's a nice day for them as well. All right, we'll talk more racing in a couple hours when we're back with OTB Live. In the meantime, enjoy the racing this afternoon. We'll all cash some tickets, hopefully, as the afternoon progresses. I should remind you, uh, normally at the end of the show, I say, be back here for more racing across America tomorrow 10. That's not the case tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow, Easter, 
and uh, the racing rules in New York say no racing on Easter. So uh, won't be back in tomorrow, but certainly back in in a couple hours for OTB Live. We'll see you then. You're watching OTB TV, a service of Capital Off-Track Betting.